I'm delighted to be in conversation with John Kay about his magnificent treatise, Himalaya Exploring the Roof of the World. I have been an admirer of John's work ever since I devoured the two volumes of his Explorers of the Western Himalayas. I had just begun my PhD on the region at the time, and his passion for the Himalayas has been inspirational, which is why I must begin by asking you, when and how did you discover the Himalaya? And why have you been fascinated with it ever since? Um, th thank you, yes. Um, I, I, I suppose it's, I have, I've always had a fascination with the mountains, with hills. And um, in fact, for the last 50 years, I've lived in the uh, West Highlands of Scotland, mm -hmm. surrounded by hills. And I so think if you- Can you hold it up? If you live amongst hills, it quite has a, 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 an effect upon you. It helps to uh, uh, elevate your sense of uh, position. It gives, you, it gives you bearings. The landscape, the horizon, assumes a certain shape in your brain. And it gives you a kind of focus, uh, a position in the region, in the world, which one lacks if you live in the plains. Um, and so I've, I've always had this uh, love of the mountains. But the first time... I really had any experience of Himalaya was in 1965, 65, a long time ago when um, I came to uh, India for the first time and then to Kashmir to fish. Uh, I'd heard there was very good uh, fishing and well-run uh, fishing in, uh, trout fishing in Kashmir and I was very keen on fishing. Anyway, so I had two weeks in uh, fishing in Kashmir and loved it. And then I came back uh, about two years later and actually um, stayed in Kashmir for about six months. And that's when I actually started writing. So um, the, it's not, uh, the, the Himalayas got me into writing really, uh, uh, particularly books, but originally uh, as a freelance um, journalist. Um, and I suppose I've been coming back to not just to India, but to Himalaya, uh, to all the Himalayan lands, every two or three years anyway, ever since. Um, so I've been very lucky. For a time, uh, I um, uh, worked as a correspondent, uh, political correspondent. I also took uh, led trekking parties up into the mountains. This was from Kulu Manali, and then later accompanied very kind of upmarket tour groups um, to, into Bhutan, Sikkim, and Nepal, and so on. So uh, I'd be coming back, and then uh, finally, I suppose I did a big series on, uh, of documentaries on the radio for the BBC uh, about the Himalayan kingdoms, and that was in, I suppose, in the 1980s. Um, and uh, so it's been a kind of lifetime's um, uh, uh, passion, and in a way, the book reflects that, but it isn't really about my experiences. Uh, I'm writing about the region as a whole and trying to ask uh, readers and public to have uh, to regard Himalaya as something uh, extremely valuable, not just as a, a playground or a tourist paradise. So anyway, that's my association with uh, Himalaya and uh, it continues and I'm hoping to go back uh, there again later this year. It's quite an ambitious feat, though, writing an overarching history of the Himalayas, yeah. given the vastness of the region, the geographical complexity. Presumptuous, the I think, is the word you want. No. <laughs> <laughs> ambitious, but we expect nothing less. Um, and, of course, uh, the ecological and cultural diversity. So what is the raison d'etre of the book, and what are the different aspects that you chose to focus on? Well, I, I wanted to focus on almost every aspect of, uh, of Himalaya and and what makes the region so unique. But the, really the purpose of the book is uh, to try and establish the idea in people's minds that there is such a place as Himalaya. That Himalaya, uh, although it may be uh, politically divided between various um, neighboring nations, uh, and although it's had a very checkered and uh, often rather tragic history, is in fact a single uh, uh, environmental, ecological zone, and perhaps the most important one in the entire world, and really should be regarded with as much reverence and concern as, say, Antarctica or Amazonia. Uh, this is a, 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 so, so many people in, the, in this part of the world, in East, Southeast Asia uh, and South Asia, are totally dependent on 
the water tower that is Himalaya on the on the uh, rivers that come down from the mountains for agriculture and livelihood and so on, uh, and, uh, it, and and culturally and socially and so on. It's it's absolutely crucial, central to the whole of South and, and Eastern Southeastern Asia, and uh, we should try and forget. And then it's so politically divided. And think, if you think of a physical map, you know a, a political, political map has all the state boundaries on it. A uh, physical map just has contours, and physical maps are usually sort of um, green, uh, except where the sea, where the sea is blue. Um, but uh, in, uh, on a physical map, there are only, really only two uh, notable, outstandingly different regions, which are usually portrayed in white and purple. One is Antarctica is entirely glaciated. The other is Greenland, uh, which is usually white because it's got uh, such um, uh, a massive depth of ice. And the other is Himalaya. Himalaya, in the middle of Asia, there's this splodge of kind of white, purple color, sometimes even brown, uh, indicating an area, in fact, uh, that uh, the average altitude is uh, something like 13,000 feet or, say, 3,000 meters above sea level. So it, Himalaya, for a start, is three kilometers up compared with the rest of uh, Asia, or with the sea levels anyway. Um, so that's the most distinctive feature uh, of Himalaya. It's, 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 it's very high, and it's one of only three uh, heavily glaciated regions in the entire world. And just on those grounds, it uh, deserve, deserves much more attention and concern and study uh, than it has received uh, in uh, recent years. So that was one of the reasons for writing the book. I wanted to establish the identity and the integrity of this vast region that's called Himalaya. And I was very insistent with the publishers that it had to be uh, so typeset as it would be read as Himalaya rather than Himalaya. So uh, I got them to put what they call as a macron, or sort of line above the a, the first A in Himalaya, so that people might actually try and pronounce the name correctly. It is, of course, from the Sanskrit, Hima which means snow, and Alia means abode, abode or area or region of snow. And so it means the uh, abode of snow. And it, is, uh, it, it, it conveys the integrity and the identity of the re region perfectly, whereas the Himalayas is a bit vague and usually used just to refer to one or more mountain regions which are part of Himalaya. You preface the book with the line, history has not been kind to the Himalaya. The region is finally receiving at least the scholarly attention that it deserves with the growing field of Himalayan studies and the vital importance of the region to South and Central Asia and indeed the world is being recognized. Why do you think we have not been kind to the Himalaya, even as it captures our imagination? Well, I don't think we'd be particularly unkind to Himalaya, but, but, but uh, obviously there are examples. But um, uh, what I was trying to say is that history has been rather tough on Himalaya. Uh, the region has been uh, constantly um, uh, acquired or desired uh, and penetrated and uh, invaded and so on by uh, uh, neighboring states. Um, Himalaya, of course, was uh, first of all claimed by Buddhism, uh, which spread to the region from uh, Kashmir and from uh, eastern India. Uh, and then uh, Islam uh, penetrated uh, Himalaya from the west and got about as far, well, as far as Kashmir, that's about as far west as it got. Um, and uh, then d uh, the Dogras, um, the British, uh, Nepali, Gurkhas, and so on, have all, one time or another, nibbled at the fringes of Himalaya. And that, in a sense, uh, explains its curious makeup today, whereby you have this kind of swag, like a swag of player flags, looped along the base of Himalaya. Uh, all these erstwhile little, little kingdoms like uh, Bhutan, Sikkim, Nepal, uh, Kuman, Garhwal, uh, Kulu and so on, round on into Kashmir and into what's now Gilgit, um, Gilgit Baltistan in Pakistan. Um, and, uh, and, and the same sort of effect has been going on uh, on the uh, eastern uh, borders of 
uh, Tibet, which has been steadily nibbled into by uh, the neighboring Chinese provinces of uh, uh, Yunnan and Sichuan and so on. So uh, this is uh, uh, one reason why um, I feel that uh, history has been rather hard on Himalaya. I mean, one could explore it from various other points of view, but uh, that was really what I was trying to say with that phrase. It wasn't that we are doing something, we personally are doing anything too awful, uh, but I would like people to, uh, again, as I say, start thinking of the region as a whole and thinking what uh, is, is best for Himalaya and for the people of Himalaya, uh, and a bit less about uh, regional and local politics. Um, that's a very interesting outlook. Because on the one hand, Himalayas has also, like I said, captured our imagination. It's been venerated in a number of religious traditions. But in any case, the book you open with the 1903-04 British expedition to Tibet, led by France's young husband. So I have two related questions. First, please tell us about the young husband exp uh, expedition and why you thought that would make a good entry point. And second, your account reveals the romanticization of Tibet on one hand and also the casting of it as a savage and backwater place on the other. Yeah. So how, how do these two sides of the colonial perception come about? Yes, the first chapter of the book uh, is uh, devoted to this um, uh, expedition or really invasion of Tibet uh, by the British under the... Uh, uh, during the time of the Viceroyalty of Lord Curzon, uh, this expedition which was led by, it's always referred to as an expedition, but actually, I mean, there were 3,000 troops and they had to fight their way all the way to Lhasa, so it was an invasion. Um, but I thought that uh, I would uh, use it as a kind of introduction to the subject, partly because uh, I needed some sort of structural shape for the book, and, and uh, the Young Husband expedition managed to anticipate so many of the themes uh, and ideas which were explored in the book, that it seemed a good place to start. Um, and secondly, a awful lot of the personnel of this uh, expedition um, uh, went on to publish accounts, not just of the expedition, but also of, of, of Tibet as a whole, or of Himalaya as a whole. Um, and some of them were appalled um, and thought that Tibet, Tibet was the most backward place in the whole world and incredibly primitive an incredibly hard place to live and so on, and really um, uh, 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 despaired of it, if you like. And then other members of the same expedition actually came away in a way as, as not quite as Buddhist, but as, as, as highly uh, reverential of Tibetan civilization. And it is these two contrasting themes, approaches to uh, Himalaya, which uh, recur again, again and again in the book. Um, uh, I don't want to go into all the personalities, but some of them were heavily kind of influenced by the, the Times correspondent. The correspondent for the London Times was uh, a great personal friend of Rudyard Kipling, and he obviously took a very kind of Kipling-esque attitude to the whole expedition. Then there was a man who was uh, reporting for the uh, Daily Mail, a man called Edmund Candler, who was totally besotted by Tibet, and he thought in the end he came away as... Um, spent most of the rest of his life going backwards and forwards into Tibet. He was still uh, uh, exploring uh, the base of uh, Nanga Parbat, uh, the great mountain in um, uh, Kashmir, uh, at the, uh, not shortly before the time of um, independence and partition. So he spent most of his life really rambling around in Himalaya. So you have these very different attitudes uh, which surface in this uh, early 1904 expedition to or invasion of Tibet. Um, the, it was also that which kind of set the the, the agenda for uh, foreign for, for, for Tibetology, for the study of Tibet. Um, uh, in that all the much of what was known about Tibet, uh, even in the 1950s, still dated from the time of the Young Husband expedition. So it served a useful kind of structural purpose for the book, and it also to my mind, managed to encapsulate so much of what uh, follows in the book. And that's why um, I put it up front. And you'll find in, in the book there are frequent subsequent references to, to this expedition. So we tend to think of the Himalayas as eternal. 
but uh, <laughs> your book reveals that um, neither are the mount uh, neither are they the highest mountains in the world, nor particularly old, at least by the standards of eternal time. So please tell us about the different mountain chains that constitute the Himalaya, the larger region, and about the erogenous discovery of the Himalaya as a whole. You might as well explain what the term erogenous discovery means. Uh, orogen <laughs> oh, it's, not or it's not erogenous, it's orogenous, which means uh, formation of mountains, the study of mountains originally. Yes, um, I was really interested when, uh, when uh, researching the book to try and show how much we have learned from Himalaya um, uh, uh, as a, or as a result of um, exploring Himalaya. Uh, and one of the things that immediately came up was uh, this whole question of the origins of uh, uh, Himalaya and of the mountains and how mountains are actually formed. Um, and a lot of what we know about mountains today in terms of... Uh, them being upthrust as a result of plate te tectonics, plate collisions, um, is a result of um, early explorations uh, and discoveries in uh, Himalaya. Uh, someone, uh, John McPhee, the great um, American um, writer on geological subjects, uh, said that if not, he wrote a, a sort of enormous um, uh, two or three volume work on, on uh, geology. And he said, if, if there's one thing that's important in this book, it's this sentence, that the summit of Mount Everest consists of limestone, i.e. of uh, uh, solidified uh, insects, sea creatures, in fact. Uh, and that um, if uh, when, they, you know, when people went to the moon, they immediately brought, about, brought, back, brought back rocks from the moon. Well, when the first uh, climbers to reach anywhere near the summit of uh, Everest and the other great 8,000 meter peaks in Himalaya brought back rocks and they were examined and they found within the structure of the rocks all these fossil uh, evidence that actually that uh, rock had originally lain at the bottom of, of the ocean uh, and it had ended up at the top of, um, uh, of Himalaya. And so the whole idea of how uh, rocks were upthrust to produce mountains and the, how they were formed and so on was um, uh, 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 explored through discoveries not just in Himalaya but also in the Alps but particularly in Himalaya. Um, the great explorer of uh, the Baltistan region, a man called Henry Havisham Godwin Austin, after whom K2 was almost named, um, he was actually uh, a great specialist on uh, um, uh, 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 mollusks on uh, sh on shell uh, shell life, sea life, and uh, he um, uh, discovered that the whole of the Pangong Lake in Tibet was uh, just surrounded by great beds of shells, seashells, miles and miles. I mean, you can't really get much further from the sea than than in Tibet or Ladakh. Um, so uh, we learned an awful lot about. Um, how uh, the earth was created, how it's been created, and also about the origins of man. Um, one of the most important uh, areas for fossil finds about the earliest uh, the signs of life on earth are in the Siwalik Hills, uh, very near to Shimla. Um, and the most uh, amazing collections were brought back from in the 1830s from places like um, Saharanpur uh, and uh, near to Shimla, uh, where these great fossil beds of some of the earliest life forms uh, were first found and some of the earliest, um, uh, most primitive fauna and so on were excavated. So uh, we owe an awful lot to Himalaya for in terms of how we understand uh, our world, how we understand life on this planet and, planet and how it developed. Um, so much to learn from Himalaya and uh, that's just one, those two subjects form just a couple of small chapters in the book, so it's, it's not absolutely, you don't have to be a geologist to understand it, it's very straightforward. Sorry? Yes, you just keep going. Yes, yes. So you described Tibet rather beautifully as the high heart of the Himalaya. Aside from its geographical location, um, tell us why or the different ways in which it is central to your conception of the Himalaya? 
Yes, um, uh, Tibetan is often described as the, and particularly the Chang Tang, the Northern Plains, is described as the empty quarter of Himalaya. Actually, it's more like the empty three quarters. Most of Himalaya is actually Tibetan plateau uh, and is very thinly populated, if at all, and is uh, mainly a country for uh, 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 grazing yaks and, uh, and not, uh, has very few uh, urban centers of any sort. Um, so, I mean, the essence of uh, Himalaya, it probably is Tibet, and Tibet is essentially um, a, a, a very sparsely populated, sparsely poorly developed um, and um, challenging uh, terrain. But it is uh, a, a, a not untypical of other parts. I mean, Ladakh is very similar, for instance. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so it is very typical of the region as a whole, and it is certainly the largest component uh, of, of, of Himalaya. Since I conducted a session yesterday on nomads with Anthony Sutton and Ilse, uh, Ilse Kohler Rolfsson yes. about their fascinating new books on nomads and pastoralists. I wanted to ask you why the creation myth of the Tibetans alludes to only farming, mining and trade as their original occupations and leaves out pastoralism, which is such an essential feature of life in the Himalaya. Yes, I, I, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm not actually not sure what the answer is. I've been thinking about this. Um, and there is a very important kind of uh, Tibetan creation myth in which uh, uh, the requisites of kind of, of settlement and civilization are uh, 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 devolved or uh, extended to uh, the earliest settlers, the earliest uh, Tibetans by the Bodhisattva. Um, and they include uh, gold and seeds and so on for arable farming, gold for mining. And so but there's no mention at all, as you say, of, of pastoral. In fact, there's no mention, as far as I can remember, of any, of any uh, quadrupeds at all. So it's not just uh, uh, sheep and cattle, but also horses don't seem to have figured in the, um, uh, the uh, patrimony that was uh, given to the Tibetan people. And I, I have a feeling that Perhaps the idea was that, uh, I think perhaps one could find the same sort of thing in parts of the Vedas, that um, the idea of this creation um, by the deity was that they wanted to get man to settle down in a particular area. They didn't, uh, early primitive man tended to be nomadic by nature or uh, for, uh, for purposes of hunting, hunter gathering and so on. Uh, and the idea of the, uh, the Tibetan creation myth was to uh, encourage or instill the idea of permanent settlement uh, and so uh, actually the basis of civilization. Uh, that, that would be my theory, but I d you may have your own feelings about this. So you know more, far more about horses than I do. Anyway. Uh, well, I've been thinking about it. Trade does cre um, you know, carry the connotation of nomadism. Uh, long distance trade, of course, and also yeah. possibly that this origin myth was sort of modified and finalized after settled, you know, settled society became the dominant model, perhaps. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. yeah. so moving on to one of your other personalities, you say the Italian scholar Giuseppe Tucci, the founding father of Tibetology, combined unrivaled Buddhist scholarship with the, with the appetite of an insatiable collector. Yet he was also the embodiment of Western cultural colonization. He was funded by the fascists, he was racist in his outlook towards the Tibetans, and he adopted the most dubious means to acquire Buddhist artifacts and texts. So what do you make of his contentious legacy? Yes, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned Giuseppe. Tucci, uh, he uh, is the uh, great Italian Tibetologist who had such an influence on all subsequent studies of, uh, of uh, Tibet and uh, Himalaya. Um, he was quite a difficult man. But it also raises the question of uh, the relationship between um, fascism and uh, Tibet, which would later become quite important. Um, his, uh, Tucci thought... Uh, that uh, Italy should have a special relationship with uh, 
Tibet, because uh, both of them were such ancient, Italy and Tibet were such ancient civilizations, uh, and he managed to persuade uh, Il Duce, uh, Mussolini, the uh, Italian fascist leader, to fund his expeditions. Um, and so they became a kind of national enterprise um, for uh, the fascist government uh, in the 1930s. Um, and uh, Tucci uh, was not only interested in, in, in finding out everything he could about uh, Tibetan religion and artifacts and um, uh, uh, iconology and so on, but also he wanted to collect and to bring materials back to Italy. And so he became one of the great uh, collectors of um, what he always called Buddhist realia. Um, and uh, in doing so, um, he used slightly dubious uh, means, and obviously he had great financial resources and um, was able to uh, uh, compensate monasteries where he, he took objects from, but that didn't stop him from going ahead uh, and didn't, didn't stop the monks from even giving up these objects. But it was, that was the, the, the time. Uh, I mean, he was in the same tradition of, uh, I don't know whether any of you heard of Mark Oral Stein, who was the great um, uh, discoverer and explorer, excavator of the hidden cities along the Silk Road in the, uh, at the turn of the century, so a bit before Tucci. But he used exactly the same t tactics. And it, it now seems rather reprehensible to us at a time when uh, the British Museum is trying not to, or indeed perhaps uh, trying to negotiate some way of returning um, precious objects to the countries from which they came that actually uh, no, there was no sense uh, in, at the time when Tucci was working or when Stein was working that, that uh, these objects would be better left where they were. It was felt that you know, the only way that they could be conserved for posterity was if they were taken away and put in a museum in London or Berlin or Paris or somewhere. Uh, and so that was really Tucci's attitude was, was highly acquisitive and... Uh, Appropriate, appropriational. He wanted to appropriate Buddhism and uh, to um, uh, re-establish its um, uh, a lot of its most precious objects in places that he thought that they would be safer. Um, he was also actually a very difficult man. The, anyone who worked for him said he was absolutely impossible <laughs> and actually rather unpleasant. But that, that has to be said for an awful lot of explorers. Um, uh, uh, explorers are not, as a whole, um, delightful people and uh, um, uh, need to be fairly unscrupulous in order to get their way. And so, uh, so I don't think he's exceptional in that respect. And of course, the connection between fascism and um, uh, Tibetan Buddhism uh, was uh, encapsulated later when um, Heinrich Harrer, who was the uh, German climber who was imprisoned interned uh, during World War II in India and then escaped to Tibet and famously spent seven years in Tibet. Um, he had uh, strong links with the SS, the, the, the Nazi secret service, um, and uh, most of the German climbers at that time were being funded by um, uh, Himmler's um, uh, SS and were indeed members of it. And when... Um, uh, uh, Hara died, it was discovered that um, he actually had very uh, close links and had been uh, encouraging this kind of racial uh, identity between uh, German people and the so-called pure Aryans of, of the Himalayan region. German climbers always tend to think of Himalaya as, um, as uh, the homeland. We're going to climb in the homeland, <laughs> they said, as they set off on the umpteenth time to try and reach the top of Nanga Parvat in the 1930s and 40s. Um, so there was that uh, unfortunate uh, connection between fascism and uh, em embodied, of course, particularly in the swastika, both except that the, um, uh, the uh, Tibetan swastika can be, can be done two ways, can be done backwards or forwards, whereas the Nazi swastika can only, swastika can only be drawn in one direction. But anyway, there was another... Uh, when. Uh, the first German expeditions went into uh, Himalaya to climb the mountains. They had a habit of, 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 of sticking a, a swastika on the top of the, uh, of the peak they climbed to, uh, to uh, claiming it as a kind of Aryan homeland. 
So we're fast running out of time. So would you rather talk about Pashmina and William Moorcroft or, or Glaciers? Ah, uh, glaciers, yes. <laughs> in, so, <laughs> in, in because, yeah, your account of the glaciers is fascinating. I had no idea they had a sex life. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I remember thinking exactly the same. This is it, I'm, someone's putting my leg here. <laughs> when this old fellow in, um, I think it was somewhere above Gilgit. Anyway, I can't remember. Somewhere up in the Karakoram, uh, started talking about. We were looking at this great array of glaciers coming down from the peaks. And he said, oh, that's a girl, that's a, and that's a, that's a man. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, they've all, they all got a sex, and uh, that's how we control them, how we manage the glaciers. Uh, the Karakoram has very small rainfall, and they're very dependent on snow melt from uh, the glaciers. And it's, in fact, the Karakoram is the one part of the Himalayas where uh, the glaciers are actually at the moment uh, stable or advancing, if anything, rather than retreating. It's, it's always known as the Karakoram anomaly, uh, uh, unlike the, in the rest of Tibet, where glaciers tend to be retreating. Anyway, in, um, in Gilgit, Bajistan, and increasingly in Ladakh, too, um, they've been using uh, glaciers to uh, irrigate uh, crops. Uh, and, but very often the glass is not quite where you want it to be in terms of irrigating the crop. So you may have to create your own glacier, which is really quite easy to do. Um, uh, you, you take a goat skin and you fill it with the ice from uh, a female, uh, no, from a male glacier, and then you suspend it above uh, a point where you want your glacier to run from. Uh, so that it drips onto a bit of male glacier, and slowly these glaciers will form. Uh, and they've been doing this now for so, uh, oh, 30 or 40 years, and the Aga Khan Foundation has a, a, a whole program of uh, glacier support uh, funding, um, so that um, uh, farmers in the Karakoram and uh, neighboring parts of Ladakh can uh, uh, access the latest information on how to manage your glaciers uh, and um, uh, can provide some funding uh, for uh, construction purposes. And in Ladakh, the same principle is being used now, but it's not so much a question of creating male and female glaciers, but of creating ice towers. Uh, and during the winter, they spray uh, water from a high mountain tarn onto a prepared piece of ground and let it build up into a sort of pyramid and into a kind of skyscraper of ice, which is, as the temperatures rise will melt and pr produce melt water just at the time when the spring crops most need it. So um, this business of, of, of glaciation is being turned to, as, as we understand glaciers, it's now being turned to more, more purpose. And although glaciers everywhere are indeed, of course, retreating because of climate range, a change. Uh, in the Karakorums, uh, the change is not so obvious. In some places, they're not retreating at all. And anyway, uh, we can learn a lot from the people of Gilgit, Pakistan, and Ladakh about how to conserve uh, uh, water as, as ice um, throughout the year. So, um, we're running out of time, and we should allow a few um, audience questions. But before that, I wanted to ask you so about tourism, which, because you've been emphasizing the importance and the integrity of the region and how we need to protect it and recognize it as endangered, in a way. So, tourism has been the mainstay of many Himalayan economies for a while now, from the adventure tourism of Nepal or the religious tourism of many parts of the Indian Himalayas. But the pressure this and unchecked development puts on the fragile ecology of the region is also quite obvious. What is the solution? How can these remote states sustain themselves while preserving the Himalaya, which is additionally mired in so much geopolitical conflict? Yes, I mean, uh, we've all seen those pictures of, of um, this kind of Gore-Tex uh, conga of climbers on the summit ridge of uh, Everest. Um, uh, 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 even, I mean, even uh, sort of 20 years ago or so, uh, Reinhold Messner was complaining that any fool 
could climb Everest. It was just because it was all, uh, you know, the steps are already there, the ladders are already there. You've just got to uh, get to the top and come back down again, but you get, you're being pushed along by the people behind all the time. So the whole thing sounds quite appalling. People with uh, very little climbing knowledge and a lot of money uh, uh, can go to the top of Everest whenever they want now, weather conditions are obliging. Um, and uh, we've all seen those photographs of uh, base camps. The last one I saw, I think, was the base camp at K2, which it looked as if they'd had a music, f music festival there the night before. The whole thing was just strewn with uh, tents, a mangled uh, um, uh, 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 poles and so on, um, and climbing equipment and oxygen cylinders and so on. And this, uh, if... if um, if local governments, particularly in Nepal and Pakistan, are going to go on handing out climbing permits uh, on, uh, uh, in, 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 on such a scale, then this is only going to get worse. And so they have to have some program of, uh, of, of conserving the areas which are affected by climbing. And the same now goes for trekking. There are so many trekking routes aligned with tea houses and um, uh, 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 internet cafes and so on. Um, that uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the good news is that there is much more interest in, in, in uh, Himalayan studies. Um, there are centres for Himalayan studies being set up all over the place. There's one in Oxford, there's one in Delhi and so on. Um, and people are beginning to take the region more seriously. Um, and uh, there's no way we can stop people from climbing mountains or stop people going on pilgrimage and, and littering the place. Um, but the uh, governments, uh, the local governments have to be encouraged to take a much more responsible attitude to it and stop handing out so many permits and uh, uh, particularly on like uh, the Everest routes. Um, and uh, it, there just needs to be more exchange of information, more uh, awareness of that the whole region is being endangered by uh, excessive uh, exploitation. And we're talking about tourism here, but actually much more serious is the, uh, our concerns about the um, damage that's being done to the environment, particularly by hydroelectric dams, which are now just horrifying in uh, eastern Tibet and in uh, northern Pakistan or in uh, um, what used to be part of Kashmir. Uh, massive dams, that, 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 which are three or four times the size of the Yangtze dams, uh, um, um, and what was three or four times the yield in terms of electricity are being actually cons constructed at this moment. Uh, and um, uh, the effect that they're having on the local environment is uh, appalling. The Mekong, Mekong River, which is one of the most important Himalayan uh, rivers, um, is, uh, is now dammed about 20 times uh, at different stages down the river. Um, and this uh, affects not only... Uh, the people in the mountains, but all the people who depend on the rivers, on the water, uh, in uh, in southern Vietnam and so on, um, uh, and uh, the potential here for strife is, an, uh, it, I mean, no one's really discovered quite how to uh, an equitable way of dividing the benefits of these great hydroelectric schemes. Um, one hopes that eventually some sort of system like the Indus Waters Treaty, which was um, uh, devised soon after partition, something like that, some sort of general guidelines uh, for the safety and security of these installations uh, uh, should be observed by all those uh, countries involved. And so there's ample opportunity, ample reason for more collaboration between uh, the, the countries involved uh, in Himalaya and more recognition of the dangers of uh, excessive development. Okay, one quick question. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. So I have a question about, uh, you know, I mean, you've lived a certain amount in the hills, I'm sure. So do you think there's like a certain effect living in the Himalayas or the, at such an altitude? Does it have an effect on the people's, you know, perception? Yeah, yeah I mean, not like in the lifestyle aspect, but, you know, some, something as deep as in the subconscious and then in turn, their imagination itself, something like that. Absolutely. I mean, this is actually a, a, an approach taken by Tucci, who I was talking about, the Italian Tibetans, he strongly maintained that the whole nature of Tibetan Buddhism was dictated by the terrain. 
and it was hard to see this terrain without thinking in terms of uh, uh, the demonic images loved by uh, Tibetan artists and uh, the different forms of worship and so on. And absolutely, and I'm quite sure it's, it's, it would be an interesting subject for an entire book. I, I mean, I, I, I mentioned it, we talk about it in one or two chapters, but um, it's, I, if anyone wants a subject to explore, that would be a very good one. I must say, I'm a bit wary of geographical determini determinism, but yeah. it is a very pronounced geography, the Himalaya. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, sir. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure uh, listening to you. So, I'm a great fan of your work. I grew up reading your uh, history books on the uh, East India Company and India. So, why did you choose uh, Himalaya as a subject? Uh, did you uh, do you think that uh, is there anything still left in Himalaya uh, on the, from the historical aspect as a historian to be explored? Ah. <laughs> yes, I think probably quite a lot. Um, I, I, I decided I, I wanted to write about Himalaya because I thought I was in a good position to do so, having written quite major histories of both uh, India and uh, China. And I thought I could see it from uh, all directions. And also because uh, though, it, uh, though lots is written about Kashmir and uh, 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 Tibet and so on. There's very little recognition of the uh, what I keep calling the integrity, the wholeness of the region, and of how all the problems in the region and the religions and so on have quite a lot in common. I mean, uh, we think of the most uh, typical characteristic of um, uh, Buddhism uh, of, is, of, is this passion with mountain pilgrimage. Uh, well, actually, it's not just a, a, a Buddhist obsession, it's also, of course, a Hindu obsession with uh, uh, pilgrimages to Amarnath, for instance, in Kashmir. And there are also even uh, uh, sites associated with, with Muslim peers who attract quite a number of pilgrims. So pilgrimage is a very much a mountain pilgrimage, it's very much a feature of the region. Ah. We're running out of time. One minute. Yes. Okay, yes, carry on. No, one minute. Finish, uh, but in one minute. Okay. Uh, well, I think I could... I mean, there's a, there's a lot more that could be written about Himalaya, and I'm sure it will be. And as I said, it's, it's really encouraging how already uh, schools of Himalayan studies are seem to be springing up everywhere, and I'm sure that we're all going to hear an awful lot more about Himalaya. I would like... To, you know what happened with... In the, in the 1930s, Antarctica was declared a sort of a, a, a zone of international collaboration in terms of scholarship and research. And I would like some sort of overshadowing uh, organization like this uh, that would take uh, Himalaya seriously and try and uh, uh, bring all the uh, component uh, nations to agree on uh, what they can and cannot do there. What is your favorite part of the Himalaya? Quickly. Uh, I think, well, look, for me, Ladakh, Kashmir, because that's re really where I first fell in love with the region. That's it. Well, thank you.